I'm going to talk about discernment today. And if you guys would grab a Bible and if you would turn to 1 John 4, I'd like to read a few scriptures out of there to start with. through 6 says the following, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of God, or sorry, messed that one up already. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So today, as I said, I'd like to talk a little bit about discernment. And I'm by no means an expert on this topic. But it's my desire that you would listen to what I have to say. And then take it home with you. And be like a good Korean. I want you to go to the Word. And I want you to prove what I say. Or prove that I'm wrong. Because I'm either right or I'm wrong. I hope I'm right. It's my heart and soul's desire. As I stand here today. To accurately divide God's Word. But you need to do your part. And make sure that what I say is right. Because I'm just simply a vessel up here. And I can succumb to falsehoods if I'm not careful. So let's, um, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you. We come before you and we ask God that as we look into your word, that you would reveal truth to us, God. It's not what I say. It's not who I am. It's nothing about me other than I am the vessel you have chosen this day to present your word. God, I ask that I would present it correctly, rightly. It would not be misunderstood. It would not be taken wrong, God, but that it would go forth and accomplish what you set it forth to do. We pray this in the marvelous name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Okay. So the day and age we live in, as much as the Apostle Paul of the day he lived in requires that we know how to discern what is truth and what is error. I'd like to mainly teach out of the passage of 1 Kings chapter 3. So if you guys want to turn there. That's my first part. I'm going to teach out of it minute to get there, and then I'm going to go ahead and read this. <clears throat> yeah, 1 Kings chapter 3, and it'll actually be uh, verse 9. It says, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to come and govern this, your great people? Now this verse is right in the middle of a time when Solomon had been appointed the king of Israel. The people were sacrificing in high places. It says because that no house had been built for the name of the Lord. It hadn't gotten done yet. The passage tells us that Solomon loved the Lord. And he walked in the statutes of his father David. But it also says that he sacrificed 
in the high places as well. And obviously for the same reason, there was no house built for the name of the Lord yet. And that would come later. Solomon's making a sacrifice at Gibeon when the Lord appeared to him in a dream. God asked Solomon, what can I give you? Solomon said, Lord, I would ask for wisdom that I may lead your people and be able to discern between good and evil. You know, Solomon knew what the vast responsibility was of leading God's people. He wanted to get it right. But he felt like a little child. He said, I feel like a little child. You know, he was God's servant to a people that he deemed too vast to number. He was a king, but he knew that he was God's servant. He couldn't do the task alone, he knew that. But he wasn't afraid to ask for God's provision. He knew from where his strength came, and he also knew the source from whence it came. Whence, from whence it came. It further goes on to state in that uh, surrounding verses that God was pleased with Solomon's request. And God went on to honor Solomon, and he blessed him even more with riches and wealth that none of his contemporaries would ever experience. And then God even pronounced the final blessing upon Solomon, that if Solomon would walk in God's ways and keep his statutes, God would honor him with a long life. Solomon knew he needed to be able to discern good from evil. Then the rest of the chapter 3 delves right into probably one of the first things that he was called upon to do. Uh, two harlots came to him. They lived in the same house. They both had infant sons. One had died in the night. And one woman now is accusing the other of swapping out the babies, the dead baby for the live baby claiming it as her own. And Solomon, using this wisdom that God had given him, was now able to determine who the mother of the living child was by judging to cut the child in half. To bring me a sword, we'll cut the child in half. We'll give one half to one mother, one half to the other. And I have to admit I don't understand the woman who had the dead child. Because the woman whose real child it was said, no, no, please give, give the baby to her. Let her have the baby. She would rather see another woman raise her son than to see her son put to death. The other woman said, yeah, that, that's okay, do it. That, that, that's, that's cold. That's really cold, guys. I mean, even for a harlot. Sorry, that's just cold. But, you know, that was all orchestrated by God. Solomon demonstrated that he could use the wisdom that God gave him to discern evil from good. The people heard about it, and they feared the king. But they saw that the wisdom of God was resting upon Solomon so that he could render correct judgments. And I'd like, if you guys would, let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 2. And I'll wait just a second for you to all get there, because I'm going to teach a little bit out of uh, Proverbs chapter 2. And the first five verses. That's good. While you guys are turning, I can grab a drink of water. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 5 says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek for her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So, of course, Solomon wrote a good portion of the book of Proverbs. <coughs> We see some of the wisdom that God lays out in the book of Proverbs. There's much we can learn if you guys and me and all of us as believers would study 
you know, obviously the whole counsel, the whole word of God, but studying the book of Proverbs, there's a lot of wisdom in there, a lot of good stuff. So the verses we just read, I want to make some comments on. You see that we must receive God's word. In other words, do we accept it as God's word? We just see it as just another book, just something that some 66 books and several authors put together and it's just a just another book? No. It's the Word of God. You see there's a common theme from Genesis to Revelation. It's all about God. It's all about Him sending His Son, Jesus, to pay a penalty that we could never pay. It's all about who God is. It's all about Him. And we have to accept that. And if we don't accept that, there's no point in going on. I could just stop right here. If we're not going to accept God, who He says He is, and His Word, and what it says, let's throw it out and let's go. Be the first to go down and start partying because if God, God doesn't know what He's talking about, we're out of luck. But we know that's not true. <coughs> we wouldn't be up here. We all wouldn't be here gathered today. We wouldn't be singing praises to our great God. We wouldn't be worshiping Him and we wouldn't be serving Him. It's by faith. God says without faith it's impossible to please Him. God has given us faith. <clears throat> faith in His Son. We have His Son, Jesus, the object of our faith. So we must receive God's Word. It says we must treasure up God's commandments. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 119 to store up God's Word in our hearts that we might not sin against Him. We go to great lengths to hide and to store and protect all these are earthly treasures. We lock our homes at night. And again, when we leave for the day, we lock them up again. We place our valuables in a safety deposit box at the bank. And we pay out massive amounts of money for insurance policies against damage and loss. But don't you think God's words and His commandments are a little more important than our earthly stuff? And God's given us a blessing of much stuff. I think it's our responsibility to take care of it the best we can. But still, God's words and His commandments, His word, is so much more valuable than that. Aren't they worth storing and protecting? Storing them in our hearts so that we have them at our disposal at a moment's notice when we need them. And we protect them there so that we don't lose them and let them slip away. Do we, so are we taking time? Are we taking time to read and meditate on God's word? So we can get it deep down inside us. And that says we must incline our ear to wisdom. We should take every and all opportunity to hear it with all seriousness. Let's really take the time to hear what it has to say. And we must apply our hearts to understanding, the next part says. <coughs> you know, if we read or hear the word of God, and yet if we decline to act upon it, we're no different than the man that James mentions as a hearer of the word only, and not a doer of the word. You know, we get God's word deep within us, partly by doing what it says, not just hearing it. You now, if you go out and throw a bunch of grain on a field that hasn't been properly broken open, or if you go out and throw grass on your lawn that hasn't been properly prepared, chances are the birds are going to come, or the heat of the sun is going to come, it's going to bake it, it's going to destroy it before it ever has a chance to sprout. And by doing the word, you see something God commands and you do it, you follow it. It's like breaking up the ground so that his word can sink down deeper into us and just become a part of our lives. The man who only hears God's word and doesn't practice it, is like a man who, looking in a mirror, walks away and forgets what he looks like. But the man who reads God's word, and then does what it says, is blessed in what he does. And we must cry out for discernment, it says. We read in 1 Peter 2, 2, that as newborn babies, desire the pure milk of God's word, so that you may grow thereby. Now, when a baby gets hungry, what does she do? All you moms know what she does. She starts crying. And nothing's going to console her. 
except you take that baby and you feed her. And she needs that milk that you provide for her. She has nothing else on her mind except getting satisfied with that milk. So we as believers, we come to the Word, we come to faith, we start crying for the milk of God's Word. And we start to grow. And we find out that we need to move on to solid food. The milk is good, but it's not sufficient anymore. We need to get deeper into the Word and get the solid food of God's Word, the meat of God's Word, so that we may grow on to maturity. And then we must lift our voice up for understanding. And I want to read what James 1.17 has to say about that. Is every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. I think it's kind of neat, but good gifts from God. And he doesn't give junk. He gives good stuff. Sometimes we don't recognize it as good because sometimes we're just too earthly minded. And, you know, it's not about the new car or the big house or the big bank account. God can bless us with that. Sure he can. And he does sometimes. And, and, and good. But I think the very best gifts that God gives can be discernment and understanding. Because that's eternal. And guys, we're not, we're not going to just drop dead one of these days and that's it. We've got an eternity. If you know Jesus as your Savior, put a plug in here for him. You know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to be with him for eternity. But if you don't, you have a dark, desperate, horrendous eternity ahead of you. So if God's gifts are good and discernment and understanding are his gifts, ask for it. Ask him for that. See what he'll do. Now we almost, we almost, we all must seek for it as silver and search for her as a hidden treasure. You know the strenuous, intense labor that men will go to to find silver and gold and precious gems I think should give us an inkling of what Simon the Solomon was stating here. I'm no miner. I've only been in a couple of caves, so I don't go underground very much. I don't like it. But when I think of mining, I think of some of the old movies and old time stuff. You see guys going down into the mine shafts and the tunnels. They've got their picks and their shovels and their lunches and their lamps because they're going to be down there all day. They like it good. I don't. But they'll go down into the earth. You guys are crazy. You know, that thing could cave in. It's dangerous. But you know what? They're looking for that small vein of gold or silver. Or they're looking for those gems. And it's got value. There's value in that. And it's worth the risk. It's worth the effort. It's worth the trouble, if you will, to do the work that's necessary to find those precious gems and the gold and the silver. And that's the way it is with God's Word. We can do a cursory read over, sometimes maybe a day or so or a period of time, maybe that's all we have. But ultimately we need to really get in there and hammer and pick and shovel at it so we can discern what it is that God's trying to tell us. As I said earlier, in the days we live in, we need it as much now as the people back in Paul's day needed it. So then you will understand the fear of the Lord, and you will find the knowledge of God. Solomon establishes in Proverbs 1.7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He also notes that fools hate wisdom and instruction. You don't be a fool. 17th century minister and author Matthew Henry, in his commentary on Proverbs 2, posits the following two thoughts. Number one, our labor, in doing what I've just been talking about, shall not be in vain. For by doing this, we shall know how to maintain a right, our communication, our communion, and our acquaintance with God. And number two, we shall know how to conduct ourselves aright towards all men. Matthew 22, Jesus 
was being asked by a Pharisee, an expert in the law, about what was the greatest commandment. And Jesus said to the Pharisee, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. <clears throat> Micah 6.8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? So we see the proper discernment of God's word is vital to a healthy relationship with God and with mankind. So now we've covered Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. We've seen how God requires us to seek his wisdom and knowledge if we are to be a discerning people. And I'd like to turn to some other thoughts that I have on discernment and some other scriptures that I'd like to share real quick. A thought came to me that I think sometimes we are all too quick to jump on the bandwagon of God's promises. And sometimes we find ourselves dragging our feet at his commands. And I think that's fairly common in human nature. We're believers, we trust God, we love God, but it takes a lot of trust to put our lives in his hands. And he wants us to do something and we don't understand. We don't get it, so we balk. He keeps at us. He keeps at us. He still keeps at us. Because he wants us to do it. Because he knows it's for our good. He knows it's for our cor correction. He knows it's for our maturity and our discipline sometimes. If you go back to Genesis and look how Satan deceived Eve, Satan was very cunning. He took God's own command, the command that God gave Adam. Look how he twisted it. He promised Eve something that God never intended for her to have. I want to repeat that. Satan took God's word. He twisted it. And he promised Eve something that God never intended her to have. God had given his commandment already to Adam. He said, don't eat the tree. <coughs> of all the other trees in the Garden of Eden, you can eat. That tree don't eat. He knew what was best for them. He gave his best for them. He knew what would be good for them. After all, God had created all things. And as we read the opening chapters of the Bible, he pronounced it all good. It wasn't like it was good, no, pretty good, or no, that's, not, that's not bad. No, it was good. It's very good. And I'd like to know how is it that we think we should have access to everything that God has brought into existence? What gives us that right? Can't we trust that He's in charge? That He knows what's best for us? How is it that I, as a mere human being, I think I can just take his word. I can make it fit whatever I want it to fit. Whatever is appropriate for my thing. And what's right in my own eyes. We don't get to do that with God's word. And we don't get to contaminate it by our own counsel. God in his response to Job and Job's friends we see in Job chapter 38, says this about it. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God goes on to question Job. He puts forth a bunch of stuff to him. And I don't have time to read it all or to tell it all. To read it, I strongly recommend you read that because it's really good. You know, were you there? When I put the Pleiades in the sky, were you there when I set the ocean in place? Many things, like I said, read it. And of course, we weren't there. 
And I have a thought, I don't know if I should share this or not, I'm gonna share it. It's just speculation, I guess. I've often wondered, how much time did Satan have to work on Eve? You know, we're not told that. But it doesn't matter, because we're not told that. It's, sometimes I just wonder, it's like, did he have a longer time, maybe, to wear her down? We know he was subtle, he was the most subtle creature in the garden. Was he so sharp that he was able to win her over instantly? I don't know. But I know that's the way false teachers work. Cult leaders. I'm moving around. Uh, cult leaders work. Some of them are pretty darn clever. They either have drummed up theories, supposed revelations from God, or else they cunningly twist the scriptures like the serpent of old to push their own agenda. <clears throat> for those who would twist and contaminate the word of God for their own agenda, I've only got this to say for them. It comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 22. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part in the book of life, from the holy city, from the things that are written in this book. That's a pretty high price to pay for tampering with God's word. I charge you today, don't do it. Specifically, that verse is talking about the book of Revelation, but I think it applies to the Word of God in general. So if Satan, and by association, his minions, his demons, and all these multitudes of false prophets can twist and misuse the Word of God to try and lead us astray, probably how much more can they do it when they use their own perverted thoughts to get ideas into our mind. Paul told Timothy to rightly divide the word. It's imperative to know the word of God so we can rightly divide it. It's imperative to have it before. You know, we're so lucky, guys. Uh, I grew up in an age, well, most of us did, where we had a Bible, a concordance, a dictionary, some tools like that. But we were lucky. We had a lot of good stuff. A lot of good men went before us and provided good tools for us to study the Word of God. And it's only by my own foolishness that I didn't take more advantage of that. But look at what we got today. It's almost too much, but we have the Internet. Yay, the Internet. Don't get me wrong, I'm on the Internet way more than I should be. But you know, we have a lot of good stuff. To the point where we have to discern what's good and evil, even more so. But we have, I've got my phone in my pocket, I've got at least two versions of the Word of God right here in my pocket. I can carry the Word of God anywhere I want to. It's imperative that we know it. We should hide it in our hearts. We must learn how to rightly divide it. We must study it like the Bereans who Paul praised for their searching of the Scriptures to prove him right or wrong. We have to accept that the Bible, God's Word, is His final authority. And anything else? Anything else? I don't care if it's a word from the Lord. I don't care if it's a revelation. I don't care if it's a dream. You better pass that through the Word of God. And you better see if it lines up with the Word of God. Because if it does, all in good. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't, you better reject it. Because God will not contradict Himself. He is not the author of confusion. I would like to think that the God who spoke the universe into existence step outside during the day and we see the beauty. This time of year is one of my favorite times of year. I see the trees blooming out. I just see the beauty. I step outside at night and you see the stars. You know how many millions and billions of miles those are away, and yet he holds that all. Jesus holds that all in his hand. He holds it all together. And I'd like to think if he can do that, 
He can preserve his word. He can keep that word. We can rely on him. We can know that he is faithful. I'm going to read a couple of verses. I need to wrap this up. But Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, <coughs> discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. 1 Timothy 2.11, excuse me, 1 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119.05 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this reason we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. And I'll wrap this up. Reading Psalm 1. It's one of the first psalms I learned when I was eight, nine years old. It was the first year I ever went to Bible camp. Spent a week away from home. But God provided a wonderful elderly man by the name of Albert, who was my counselor that year. And part of the job as being counselor was to Heard us young boys watch over us, take care of us that week, but also to get some of the Word of God into us. <clears throat> and I'll never forget from my dying day, from the very get go, his purpose that week was to teach us Psalm 1. What a wonderful, wonderful passage for somebody old enough to be my grandfather, kind enough to be my father. I'm good enough to be my friend, but teach me. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, Whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They're like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. I would just ask, Father, that you would bless the reading of your word today. That it would go forth and it would accomplish what you desire it to accomplish. Nothing I say would stand in the way or contradict what you have spoken through your word. We thank you and we love you. In the precious name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.